Leslie of Peel, Arkansas recalls a time when she was short on cash, but full of grace. She says that when the supermarket clerk tallied up my groceries, it was $12 over what I had on me, and I began to remove items from the bags when another shopper handed me a $20 bill. Oh, please don't put yourself out, I told him. Let me tell you a story, he said. My mother is in the hospital with cancer. I visit her every day and bring her flowers. And I went this morning and she got mad at me for spending my money on more flowers. She demanded that I do something else with that money. And so here, please accept this. It is my mother's flowers. You know, when I was a kid, I used to love to read my Grandma May's Reader's Digests. They were those large print ones, so they looked more like Easter egg colored books than fancy little magazines, but they were still pretty good. The stories, sometimes heartwarming, sometimes dramatic, sometimes hilarious, painted a world where we were all in it together and maybe everything would turn out all right after all. And it's been a long time since I sat down and picked up a copy and, and sat down to read it, but every now and then I still stumble across their website, rd.com, and that's exactly what happened to me recently. And as I read through some of these stories, my heart began to thaw a bit, and it took me right back to the words of Jesus when he said, by this all people will know that you're my disciples, if you have love one for another. And it also took me right into our quote for the week. Now, recently we took a look at one of two services that German theologian and pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer suggested that we Christians need to be actively practicing. The first one which we looked at is listening. Active, genuine listening. The second one goes like this. It says, the other service one should perform for another person in a Christian community is active helpfulness. To begin with, we have in mind simple assistance in minor external matters. There are many such things wherever people live together. But what does it mean to be actively helpful and how does that differ from regular helpfulness? Well, I'm pretty sure most of us could guess what it means to be helpful. So let's take a look at the descriptor instead, the word active. When I looked it up in a dictionary, it told me the word active suggests quickness and diligence as opposed to laziness or dilatory methods. Now, dilatory isn't a word that I'd remembered hearing before either, so to understand what active helpfulness is not, I looked that one up too, and I found that dilatory is to be slow to act uh, or intending to cause delay. A synonym for that is unhurried. So putting it together, active helpfulness is helpfulness with both energetic and, and engaged. It's, it's not passive or delayed. And I guess that makes sense. See, dilatory is not what a Christian community should be. He's saying that we should actively, energetically, and enthusiastically jump at opportunities to help one another and those around us. Kind of like a story, the kid in this story from Clarence of Nicholasville, Kentucky. Now Clarence says as he was leaving a store, he returned to his car only to find that he'd locked his keys and cell phone inside. And a teenager uh, riding his bike saw him kick a tire and say a few choice words and asked him, hey, what's wrong? Well, Clarence explained the situation, said, even if I could call my wife, she can't bring me her car key since this is our only car. Well, teenager handed Clarence his own cell phone. He said, call your wife, tell her I'm coming to get her key. So that's a seven mile round trip. Ah, don't worry about it, the kid said. Well, an hour later, he returned with the key. Clarence offered him some money, but he refused. He said, oh, let's just say I needed the exercise. And then like a cowboy in the movies, he rode off into the sunset. But hang on, a lot of us are pretty tired and pretty busy. Do we even have the strength to energetically and enthusiastically do anything at all, let alone actively helping those in our community? Uh, can't somebody else do it? And why does it always have to be me? I mean, honest answer is it doesn't have to be you. You don't have to do anything that you don't want to. The problem is, though, that since we're all so busy and tired, nobody is likely to actively help us either when we need it, unless our whole community gets a heart transplant. And the best way to change a community is from the inside. As Gandhi said, by being the change. Now there's this great article on sheshouldrun.org that lists six ways that you can make a positive change in your community. And with the tiniest tweaks, you can apply this to our Christian community as well. Their number one, be a good neighbor. Be the welcome wagon, a mentor, a neighborhood or, or church historian slash storyteller. Uh, help out the homebound and the vulnerable. Number two, use your voice. Support the good. Talk about your concerns with the appropriate parties. Uh, vote when there's something to vote on. Write positive reviews, notes of encouragement. 
Number three, give of your time. Clean up the grounds. Volunteer to spend some time visiting the elderly. Uh, plan to go for a walk when someone, uh, with someone you normally wouldn't see throughout the week. Organize an outreach, maybe a food or a coat drive. Um, put together some sort of little free library or pantry in your yard. Number four, put your money where your mouth is. Support your church family. Sponsor a special event. Adopt a, a church project. Maybe uh, support a GoFundMe for a neighbor who could use a little extra support. Number five, paint the place green. You know, God has assigned us to be stewards of the earth. Uh, so with that in mind, we can encourage and help facilitate a recycling program, a compost program, uh, plant or participate in a community garden. Um, think of ways to lighten your community's uh, resource and pollution footprint and at the same time grow our service and outreach footprint. And number six, just get involved. Join a church family. Join a ministry group. You know, I think... Bonhoeffer would agree with this too. He continued by saying, nobody is too good for the lowest service. Those who worry about the loss of time entailed by such small external acts of helpfulness are usually taking their own work too seriously. See, nobody is too good. I think you can replace the word good with whatever word you need to use for yourself. See, nobody's too old. Nobody's too young, nobody's too busy, too disconnected, too rich, too poor. Remember the words of Paul in Philippians 4.13? I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. See, Jesus, he's our strength in our song. If we do all this stuff because we feel obligated to or check, to check off our holiness quotas for the day, we're going to burn out. We're going to be exhausted. But if we think of ourselves simply as disciples of Jesus, uh, following his footsteps, going where he leads us, then it's not our own strength that we're relying on. It's his alone. This is his community, his family, and his ministry. You and I, we're simply the hands and the feet. And we shouldn't be doing this alone either. You know, a hand sitting alone in a glove isn't helpful to anybody, and it's kind of weird actually. Um, but when that hand is connected to a wrist, or an arm and a shoulder and a body full of parts that are all working together and supporting each other and using their own gifts in harmony with each other, then the work is easy. The community is healthy and there's no end to what God can accomplish through it. And if we as a community are working together in Jesus' name and by His strength, then nothing will be too hard for us, no dream too big, no ruler will be long enough to measure what God can accomplish through us as a community. And the Liliana from Phoenix, Arizona tells this kind of story perfectly. She says, before work one day last December, I stopped at a deli and ordered an everything bagel with cream cheese. Oh, it was toasty, warm, and I could not wait to dig in. But as I left the store, I noticed an older, hard up looking gentleman looking at the, sitting at the bus stop, knowing it would probably be his only warm meal of the day. I gave him the bagel. But all was not lost for me either. Another customer from the deli offered me half of her bagel. I was so delighted because I realized that in one way or another, we were all looked after. That's how community is supposed to work. People helping people, working together to help people. As Jesus said in John 13, 34 and 35, a new command I give you, love one another. As I've loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And we all know loving one another is rarely convenient. It can often be a struggle. It regularly messes with our plans, but we're not called to make plans. We're called to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth, bringing light and goodness to those we share this life with. You know, when I read that quote from Bonhoeffer for the first time, it's the next part that stuck out to me. And it's right at the end and it says, we must be ready to allow ourselves to be interrupted by God. Who will thwart our plans and frustrate our ways time and again, even daily, by sending people across our path with their demands and requests. See, God doesn't work on our schedule, and in order to make the most of this life together, we must allow ourselves to be interrupted by Him. We say, where are you, God? Why, what can I do to express my love for you? How can I show my family, my kids, my friends, my coworkers your goodness? And every day, He overflows our lives with moments, uh, opportunities to love and to help and to make a difference, and we have the choice. We can say, Oh, I didn't mean now. Um, God, I'm, a, I'm a bit busy. Or, uh, God, you know I can't afford that right now. Or, oh, God, I just sat down. 
I, I need a nap, to be honest. Or we can say, okay, God, sure, I don't have much, uh, but what I do have, I give to thee. God, I'm going to need your strength for this one. Thank you, God, for this opportunity. Because Matthew 25 says, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you uh, gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. You invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. Let me tell you one more story. It was the Passover and Jerusalem was full of people from near and far come to celebrate and remember how God had rescued them from slavery in Egypt and how by the symbol of the blood of the lamb, the angel of death passed by the homes of the Israelites in that final terrible plague on their captors. And yet this time, the big story was not the feast or the celebration, but the fact that they'd sentenced Jesus Christ, the actual lamb of God, to death on a cross. They'd beaten him within an inch of his life. They'd mocked him repeatedly and abused him in the court of Herod. They deprived him of sleep in an all-night farce of a trial, and now they're making him carry his own cross to Calvary. But his body failed him. Somewhere on the Via Dolorosa, Jesus stumbled and fell, and no amount of beating and abuse could bring him back to his feet. And so the soldiers, not willing to carry it themselves, they grabbed a man out of the crowd. Uh, his name was Simon, a man from Cyrene, a city in northern Africa in modern-day Libya. And he was just in town for the celebration of the Passover. The book Desire of Ages goes a bit deeper. It says, at that time, there was a stranger, Simon, a Cyrenian, coming in from the country, and he meets a throng. He hears the taunts, the ribaldry of the crowd. He hears the words contemptuously repeated, make way for the king of the Jews. He stops in astonishment at the scene, and, and as he expresses his compassion, they seize him and place the cross on his shoulders. Now, Simon had heard of Jesus. His sons were believers in the Savior, but he himself was not a disciple. The bearing of the cross to Calvary was a blessing to Simon, and he was ever after grateful for the providence. It led him to take upon himself the cross of Christ from choice and ever cheerfully stand beneath its burden. Well, did you catch that? Here was a man interrupted by God in one of the biggest possible ways, and yet it was a blessing to him. He was ever after grateful for the providence that led him to be forced to carry Jesus' burden, if only for a while. See, being interrupted by God led him to take the cross of Christ from choice and ever cheerfully stand beneath its burden. And it changed his life forever. This one experience allowed him to face hardships and difficulties cheerfully and by his own choice, knowing that God was granting him these opportunities. And later on, we see the results of this life-changing experience. His sons Rufus and Alexander became some of the earliest missionaries. And as a parent, I don't think there's anything in the whole world that would make me happier to know than that my kids would grow up to love Jesus with all their hearts and just follow where he leads. And much of this was likely due to them growing up and seeing that witness of a life willing to be interrupted by God. Psalm 72 says, He will deliver the needy when they cry out, the afflicted when they have no one to help. He'll take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence, for precious is their blood in his sight. And then all nations will be blessed through him. They will call him blessed. Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. O well, Lord, as we go about our business this week, please don't hesitate to interrupt us and give us the grace to notice the interruption. Amen.